All right, guys, I'm really excited today. I have Greg Linelli. He's got over 20 years of media experience, broadcasting, radio, TV. And today he's going to talk about how to crush an interview. I'm personally excited about this because I don't <laughs> have experience with media trainers, so I want to learn everything there is to do about kind of getting ready for that interview and how to practice. So walk us through kind of what your first steps are and what you would recommend to anyone who has that first big radio interview or TV interview. I think one of the first things you want to do is do a little research on who's interviewing you. Get an idea of the questions they may ask, even the tone of the person who's doing the interview. I think that can help and settle you down a little bit as you enter that chair. And then there's just a couple of other basic things, whether it's a phone interview or whether it's a TV interview. You want to find a place that isn't echoey. You want to make sure that when you speak that you know there's there's not a lot of... Uh, echoing going on in the background, which I think can help. Also the coloring in the background. You don't want anything that's going to be too distracting. It takes away from you. Let's face it. You are the person that is going to be shining. You don't want some picture in the background that's going to take away from what you can accomplish. So I I think those are a couple of things everybody can do. If you're doing a radio interview, you want to have great reception. And sometimes I would just tell, whether it's my client or whether it's me, if you can get on a landline, That would be ideal because you're not going to have bad cell service typically. But now the way iPhones are, for the most part, those are pretty good. But uh, that would be one tip if you can. Do a landline if it's for radio. For TV, again, it's just finding a place that's pretty quiet. The background's not too distracting. And do a little research on the person that's interviewing you. Let's start from the beginning. So I know as I'm new to doing podcasts, I'm new to doing interviews, I always have butterflies at the beginning. Is there anything that you've done in the past to help you kind of Obviously, practicing will help, but any tricks or tips on how to like calm down? Because I know even in the middle of an interview, sometimes for, for no reason, I'll get nervous. I'll feel like the pressure's on me. Sure. And I don't really kind of, I'll, I usually don't stumble through it, but I feel like I start sweating. And right. what do you do in that situation? So that's normal. Yeah. And that, that really is. And really, the best advice is the more you do it, the better you'll feel and the more comfortable you'll feel. Outside of that, understand going into an interview, you are the thought leader. You are the expert. So try to be as confident as possible. The person interviewing you doesn't know the topic. So that should put you at ease. They want to know something about you. They brought you on for a reason. So speak with confidence and repetition. The more you do it, the better you get at it. You can do some mock interviews if, whether it's in front of a a mirror or if you have a friend that's in broadcasting that might be willing to do some of those things with you to go over questions and put you in the hot chair, so to speak. I think that would be beneficial. But... Uh, do as many as you can. The messaging will be a lot cleaner and smoother moving forward, but try and be as confident as you can because you're the one that they're bringing on to be the expert. So as you know, you, with your clients, as a yeah. publicist, what can you do to help prepare them? And not just like quiz them and answers. Do you work with the radio broadcaster, TV, whoever? Do you help screen the questions that are being asked? What do you guys do? So I always try, if I can, to get the questions for my clients because a lot of them haven't had a lot of radio or TV experience. Now listen, in the broadcasting business, there are times the person who is doing the interviewing will go rogue and they will go different uh, down a path that maybe you weren't prepared for. Those are situations where again, probably repetition will come in and you'll be able to understand how to handle those situations a little bit better. But I like to try and get my clients prepared as much as possible by getting them the questions. And then I go in and I just basically tell them, listen, try not to stumble through the interview using things Um, that's all, everybody uses it, so don't worry if you do, but if you can try and eliminate that word and not stutter and stumble and speak confidently and say something that is interesting. You know, a lot of times everybody wants to give the pretty generic answer and listen, you're a thought leader, you're being interviewed because you bring something to the table. Say something that's interesting. And those are, those are the tips. I don't want to give my client too much because I think they start thinking about Mm -hmm. what they're going to say and then they don't do anything. So I I think those are a couple of things that they can do right off the bat that will help them. And I think the interesting part is very important because people love controversy. Andrew Tate is all over the internet, whether you like him or don't like him. Every time I go on TikTok or Instagram, I see his stuff because it's it's the way he presents it. It's controversial. It makes you think either you hate him or you love him, Right. but either way you're thinking about him. That's true. Therefore he wins. Um, So what do you do, and this is a hard one, but kind of, if you get a question that you feel is inappropriate, you don't want to answer. I know there's a lot of CEOs that have pretty much lost their job because they've answered the wrong question. Sure. How do you table that or kind of control that narrative and, and stop it or move it to something else? Right. So if I'm on, let's say I'm being interviewed and let's say you ask me a question that's pretty personal 
that wasn't maybe something we discussed beforehand. Right. I would just say, I, I would play it off. I just, you know, it's got, look, uh, that's probably something down the road or when we get off the air, we can discuss, but uh, I don't, you know, I don't think it's something appropriate that we should talk about right now. I mean, again, it's really a feel thing. Yeah. And what's your personality? My personality is pretty outgoing, so I may play off of that and maybe try and crack a joke and say, look, I mean, we're not going to get into that right now. Uh, maybe afterwards we can get into it. Uh, but some people may freeze and they may be like, well, uh, Probably the best way to go about that is, you know what, I'm not comfortable answering that question right now, but, you know, if that's something you want to discuss down the road, we can. And I, I put it back on the person doing the interview because uh, really that wasn't your domain, that wasn't your strength, and make him feel a little bit nervous, uh, the person who asked you the question. Yeah, I like that. I, I've also heard of kind of answering a question with a question. So if you kind of push it back on that, yeah. uh, so that, that'd be a good way to kind of spin it back right. around. It, it breaks of, the ice. Yeah. It like, breaks the ice. They ask you and be like, well, actually, how would you handle that? <laughs> and you put it right back at them because they're trying to sandbag you. Right. So it's a fun way to kind of... It is. Of, it is. But there's a lot of ways to do that. But anyways, let's go back to the basics a little bit. Let's yeah. talk about a, equipment. So you mentioned, you know, landline for radio interviews. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that you recommend for radio? I know that when I've done interviews before, they asked me to use wire headphones because they were worried that if I use Bluetooth or something, it would die or the audio quality. And, th- and that's a fair point. And, and listen, when you deal with technology, there's always a chance something is going to go wrong. Yep. So I, I think uh, that's actually a good point. If something does go wrong with the phone or let's say the Zoom link, it's always good to have a backup. Yep. And so whether that is a phone, whether that's another piece of equipment, usually give it to the producer beforehand. A lot of times the the, sh- the on-air talent will say, my producer is going to reach out to you. They're going to send you a Zoom link. But can we also get a backup number just in case something happens? And a lot of times these interviews are recorded so you can work with them a little bit if something does go wrong. So that would be the biggest advice would be just maybe have a backup plan or like two. That. Because honestly, a- equipment... Fails. It fails a lot of times and there's not much you can do. Now, if you're in an interview and something happens or let's say, you know, your earpiece comes off or let's say the host is starting to break up and you're in the middle of a live interview, just do your best to maybe answer the question as best you can. And then at at the end, you can sit there and say, well, you know, Dave, I'm I'm having a a hard time uh, hearing you right now. And then at that point, you can also hang up and call back the studio. Those are things that you have to feel comfortable in doing. Probably your first couple of inter- interviews, you would just let the producer call you back. Perfect. What about Zoom interviews? We kind of covered radio where you're going to want, you know, landline, ideally wire connection, whatever yeah. you can do there. But then Zoom's a whole other world. A lot of TV interviews that we get our clients sure. are actually through Zoom. So what are kind of the basics to setting that up? Equipment, uh, you know, right now we're shooting on cameras. Yeah. Is it worth that investment? What do you recommend? So I think if you, if you are doing a lot of... TV hits, it probably is best served to get some of the best equipment you can because yeah. you want to look good. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the things still apply, you know, in terms of the background. Don't make it too distracting if you can. And I think, again, finding a place where you know the, the reception is going to be good. Outside of that, again, it's it's basically um, is, the, is the connection going to hold up? And sometimes that's out of your control. Yeah. What about clothing? So clothing's a good one. Again, similar to in the background is just not dress professionally let's put it that i would rather have you overdressed than coming off in cutoffs and a hoodie yeah not that there's anything wrong with that and look down the road when you get comfortable with a host who may have you on here and there and and that's how they dress if that's how you want to go about it go for it but i think anytime you are going to be talking about um especially a serious topic I, i would you know something that we're dressed to right now i probably stay away from the the t shirts or anything that's uh, not seen as professional, especially early on, because I think you get that that first opportunity to make that that impression right away, yeah. and you want it to be a positive one. And I, I've been told in the past nothing too loud, so stripes and different colors might clash with your background. So you have to look at kind of what you're wearing compared to your background sure. and make sure you sometimes don't disappear. It's a good point. It's yeah. a good point. And you know, stripes may, maybe makes me look a little heavier, so I, <laughs> I I stay away from that. But no, I think I think that's a that's a that's very solid, especially because you're basically going to be interviewed from the waist up. Yeah. And again, nothing that's that's too distracting for sure. Yeah, I always shoot for solid colors, and that's then I good. wear boxers underneath. So <laughs> don't need those candles. <laughs> um, what about lighting? So I know with Zoom, lighting is critical. Lighting. Yeah. Pr- I I personally use a special webcam. I have a camera set up. Um, you can buy a webcam for like twenty bucks, all the way to a couple yeah. hundred bucks. But lighting, I think, is even more important than the webcam. It can be for sure, and it, it's that one. I think is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, yeah. don't don't do the interview in your closet. <laughs> you know, where the lighting is, is not very good. But, you know, a good way to test that is to 
to test it out. Yeah. You know, even beforehand, try and get an idea. If you know you're going to be doing an interview in a couple of days, uh, have one of your friends set up a Zoom link and, you know, do a mock interview that way. It, it'll give you an opportunity to see how do you look on camera? What's the lighting look like? Do you need to move to another room that has better lighting? So I think the great thing about Zoom is typically they're not that same day when you're setting up for an interview. I mean, sometimes they are. But if you're somebody who is looking to get into that TV uh, hit, uh, I think it's always good to play around with the equipment, um, you know, a week or two before. Yeah. And I know one of the frustrations I had, especially when we first started, is we'd have clients get on TV and they'd have a window behind them. <laughs> so all you could see was dark. Right. And then they had Zoom with their webcam yeah. from their computer that was probably 10 years old and then no microphone. So I, I yeah, the microphone's a big deal. Microphone's a huge yeah. deal. Yeah. Um, well, because it's echoey, yeah. and I, you know, I've I've run the, run into this issue a couple of times with clients, even if it's just a journalist who's taping, who's recording for a, an article. It's not even you know on the air. You don't want that echoey sound to come through because it's hard to understand. Yeah. And I think that's again that's something you can control. And I think there's like a little checklist that you can make before you get into these interviews, whether it's TV, whether it's with a reporter, or whether it's radio, just have two or three things that you can control and it'll make your life a lot easier. I agree with that. What about kind of sounding too robotic? I know a lot of people, especially for their first couple, they, they practice yeah. lines. I, right. I mean, I always recommend not having a script, but what do you work sure. through that and how do you not sound robotic? Well, and, and that's the hard one, Scott, because that a lot of times is your personality. Yeah. And you want to express yourself in a way where you don't have this monotone type voice. And for some people, it's just being comfortable. Again, repetition, doing it over and over and over again. Um, if you have to use hand gestures as I'm doing right now and you're somebody that feels like that can get your point across a little bit better, do it. That's okay. That means you're genuine. And I think you're excited to be in, in the interview. So I, I have no problem if you get animated, if you do use your hands, if it's uh, something that makes you a little more relaxed, go for it. But in terms of the monotone voice, that a lot of times depends on the person who's in that chair. Yeah. You know, because if you're not somebody who's comfortable talking, there are some things we can do to work with you. But you know, I, for me, that would be repetition. Yeah. And my personal tip is don't use scripts. I That's a good point. Personally, yeah. can't use a script, and if it's not conversational, I still struggle. Yeah, it's one of the things that I'm working towards. I would sure. love to be on like a TEDx stage, but that's scripted. So for me, that's sure. somewhere I'm not comfortable yet. Kind of as you, you know, as you're doing TV, there are scripts you're reading from a proctor. What do you do? Have besides for just you know, rep, is it just purely repetition? Kind of what? <sighs> I think a lot of it is feeling comfortable enough where you don't have to have the script. Yeah. So I mean, you mentioned it's a good point with TV. You know, a lot of times these guys and gals will be looking at a teleprompter. And I've had instances where you're reading and all of a sudden it stops. Oh no. I mean, um, you know, I still do uh, some work for the Tampa Bay Lightning and I, I remember one specifically moment. It was a couple of years ago and you're reading from a teleprompter. Now you get the script beforehand and you're able to read over it and, and you have an idea, but this is where you really need to know your craft. And if you're, the teleprompter went out. And so I had to ad lib for like two or three minutes and in TV, that is no. an eternity, especially when you don't have somebody that you can bounce some yeah. some ideas off of. And then you have people yelling in your ear. That's really not going to happen to somebody who's just being a guest. Right. And so from that standpoint, it's easier. But I would, I would look at it like this. If you can do the interview without really having to look at notes, and you should be because, again, you're being brought on to be a thought leader. Right. You'll be fine. It's really the hosts who has to deal with the technical issues of the questions and, and reading from the teleprompter. As a guest, I'd like your advice about not being too scripted because I think when you're scripted and something goes off script, you may have a hard time adjusting with the flow of the interview and sometimes that does happen. Yeah, and I think that's important as you mentioned a couple times is you are that expert, you're that thought leader. So you're there to give your opinion. I mean, I'm here to ask you questions and, and your opinion. So you should know the answers or it's, right. You shouldn't really get stumped because it's just kind of going to be a flow of conversation. Correct. And that's how, it, if you can make something conversational, then you know things are working. Yeah. What's the time kind of, kind of the scariest thing that happened on TV? Example of, you know, the teleprompter just stopped working and you yeah. had to walk through it. What kind of walk us through that example and then what you did? Sure. Well, you know, you're, first off, you're in one of the concourse areas and your face is being blown up on the Jumbotron at Amelie Arena. And so from that standpoint, it's still a little weird. You're like, okay, I'm talking in this area, but being broadcast That's right cool. on center ice, which is kind of cool, but a little nerve wracking. I mean, for anybody in that situation. So you're reading the teleprompter and all of a sudden it just goes dark and it 
and it happens. Now, luckily, I was talking about the game at that point, and obviously I'm taking notes when it comes to the game, and I'm able to talk about it somewhat intelligently, hopefully. <laughs> and you just do it until you've got the producer in your headset saying, okay, why don't you kick it to this package that we have ready. But that that takes some getting used to. Having somebody bark in your ear, especially when they're yelling. While you're trying to talk. While you're trying to talk. I gotta, I, I don't know if you ever get used to it, but you learn to deal with it. And in that instance, we got through it and uh, we were able to go to a package and I think we just closed it out without the teleprompter and it, it worked out well. But that's where you try not to stutter. You try not to use the word, you know, um, uh, um, because then you're not confident. And that comes off, I think, a, a lot of times on TV and radio. So again, you have to fake, fake it a little bit. People think you're the expert. So just flow with it. And if you have to ad lib a little bit and go off script just to get through it and to collect your thoughts, that's the other thing. It's interesting when you're being interviewed and it's taking you a while to figure out what you want to talk about. There are some ways you can delay it until that thought comes to your head. You may say, that, you know what, that's actually a pretty good question. And you know, the more I think about it, there's like four or five seconds right there for you to calm down and try to figure out what you should answer or appropriately. And uh, always complimenting the host is a good thing. You know, that's a really good question. And it's one that I think needs to get talked about a little bit more. Again, you just gave yourself four or five seconds of complimenting the host. Really doesn't take that much to do. While at the same time, try to collect your thoughts about what it is you want to talk about. That's awesome. So let's talk about clients now. What can, you know, you, you work with a bunch of clients. What can you do or what can they do to be more interesting to get more opportunities that as they build out their kind of media resume? What are the advices you give? What can they, you know, obviously having a big social media helps with things like that. But it what, does. What are those tips that you have for them? So social media is a big deal. We always tell our clients, listen, anytime you get a hit, whether it's a, a big one or a small one, shoot it out on social media. And... There's no excuse not to, yeah. let's put it this way. Because if you're not going to promote yourself, who is? And I think that's something that, that gets lost. Here's the other thing that I've found that can be a little frustrating. I understand it to an extent, but it's our job as publicists to put our clients in a position to be seen, yeah, to be read, right? You're the thought leader. We were just talking about it. When you decline the opportunities. Mm -hmm. My advice would be, unless it's just a, a really bad site and we can have conversations about what does that mean, get out there. Yeah, Get out there. Don't turn down opportunities. Now, if you get bigger and you want to be a little bit more strategic in where your time is and what you want to do, I can understand that a little bit more. But especially early on, if you get some opportunities, whether it's an article, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a TV, regardless of the size, get out there and talk because your messaging will get better every time you're out there. And if you don't, I look at it as, as a wasted opportunity. So I would tell, and I, I do tell my clients, look, these opportunities, do them. There's no reason not to. You know, we'll, we'll look at the, the publication and we have a, an idea of, of what they do, but for the most part, get out there and, and do it. Yeah, I know. For the first two years, I didn't turn out a single opportunity. I did every single one. Um, some of them I did in my bedroom with headphones on. Honestly, it got put on video, and I'm kind of embarrassed that it's even out there now because I'm looking back and I'm like... Oh, Probably got a lot of hits. <laughs> thankfully, no. <laughs> but thankfully, it, no. it still rings for my name. So, right, right. But I still think it was worth it because each step sure. is practice. So you're, you're practicing 100%. the lighting, you're practicing your background. Right. And worst case, the most nervous I've ever been is on some of the small ones that have almost no views. Yeah. And so for me, that was practice on how to get through sure. my nerves and communicate. Absolutely. And it, the more you do it, the better you will get at it. And again, if you have a message and you've never had an opportunity to be in the media before, there's no excuse not to get out there and talk about it because you are the thought leader in that space. And if you want those bigger hits to come, sometimes you got to start small. Let's talk about selling. So a lot of our clients and a lot of clients, you know, they want to get on podcast to sell something. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of coach people? I, I know that personally, I don't try to sell too much yeah. when I'm on shows, but what do you recommend to your clients and how do you kind of control that narrative? So I, I definitely don't come on with that agenda that you yeah. want to sell something because that's a turnoff. Right. And people can see that. Mm -hmm. Typically what's going to happen at the end of the interview, if it's done right, at some point, the publicist and the, and the talk show host may have already had some conversations before the interview saying, hey, my client can talk about marketing, but he also has a, a pretty interesting product coming out. If you could hit on that at the end, that would be great. There, there are no expectations, or even a book. You know, look, my client 
has um, a really good background in investments and he can talk about or she can talk about inflation and how it's hurting their clients but they also wrote a book that's out right now do you think maybe you could dedicate you know five ten minutes quickly about that at the end of the interview and nine times out of ten that host is like Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's a, you know, a 20, 30 minute interview. You're going over everything and at the end, they usually give you the floor. All right, is there anything I missed? Is there anything you want to talk? I understand you've got a book out. <laughs> Would you like to promote it? You don't want to come out and say, after the first question, well, you know, my book actually addresses that. It depends on how comfortable you are with the, with the talk show host. That may happen here and there. But typically the host will know that you have something going on behind the scenes and they should let you promote that at the end. That's would be, that would be my advice. Awesome, so I appreciate all the information, Greg. Thank you so much for being here. Kind of, let's summarize it. Any last tips for people and kind of how do they reach out to you? Well, they can reach out to me at uh, gregory.linelli at Otter PR, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, take you on and uh, get you some good hits, and it, it's been a lot of fun there. In terms of the interview process, be prepared. Uh, make sure the equipment is sound. Those are two things you can control how you dress, what it looks like behind you, those are all things you can control. And then in terms of the interviews, take as many as you can because the only way you're gonna get better is by doing it over and over again and you will get better. And of course, if they, anybody has questions, they can hit up Ryan Bass, yep. they can hit up Otter to talk about how to be a, a bit better or a lot better in front of the media because um, as you know, Scott, there are a lot of opportunities our clients get on the air, which has been great and uh, we wanna make them shine. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. This is great. A lot of fun.